I'm Michael Goldman. Welcome to another installment of Studio Daily's podcast from the Frontline series, where each month we talk with filmmakers from various disciplines about their work on current major feature films. And this month, our guest is director Ben Lewin, who recently helmed the indie historical drama The Catcher Was a Spy, starring Paul Rudd as Mo Berg, a mysterious real-life figure who, while playing Major League Baseball, was recruited by the U.S. government to spy for them during World War II. Lewin, who has written and directed dozens of films, including the acclaimed 2012 drama The Sessions, recently sat down with me to discuss the challenges of putting together a period piece based on a true story about a figure whom history does not really know much about or understand that well. We hope you enjoy the conversation. You're an unusual man, Mr. Bird. You speak seven languages. You're an athlete. You're more than up to the physical requirements of the job. What job? Since this war began, we have reason to believe the Germans are working on a fission bomb. The scientist leading their atomic program is Werner Heisenberg. We must get to him and find out how close the Germans are to a bomb. Welcome to the OSS, Mr. Berg. Millions of lives at stake. A 5% chance of losing the war to a weapon like this, you do what has to be done. You can't allow yourself to be captured. You know that I love you. You brought me here to say goodbye? I'll be back. Is this your first job? I've never killed a man. That's what you mean. It's not as hard as you might think. I don't know what God you believe in, Berg, if any. But I'll be asking mine to keep an eye on you. What if Heisenberg is on our side? Are you hoping he'll defect? If it comes down to it, are you going to be able to kill him? Maybe one moment that tells you whether the Germans have bombed. One moment when you'll learn all you need to know. No more. Ben, thanks a lot for joining us. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And I thought maybe a good place to start uh, would be to find out, you know, a little bit of the backstory for you, what attracted you to the piece generally, how you got your hands on it. I'd heard bits and pieces of the, of the Moberg story over the years, and I always said to myself, this would make a good movie, um, and here you've you've gone and done that. I, was it based on, on the uh, the book by Nicholas Dowdoff? Uh Essentially, yes, although we did use other historical sources, Um I think at the time that Nick Davidoff wrote the book, I'm not sure that Moe's OSS file was available. That was one thing that was very fascinating to look at, to read the correspondence inside the file uh, for the, you know, some people calling Moe a genius and others calling him a pain in the ass. <laughs> so um, that was a very useful source. And also... Um, all the letters that his girlfriend, Estella Huni, wrote to him while he was overseas, they were also very illuminating. So, uh, and and uh, occasional conversations with people who, who had known Mo during his lifetime. Um, but essentially it was based on, um, if not all of Davidoff's book, then a, a fair chunk of it. Uh, I, I mean, you had to kind of somehow weave a coherent narrative out of a life story that was not coherent. Uh, I mean, the trouble with Mo was that he kept reinventing himself. So you had at different stages of his life a different character that was not necessarily consistent with the previous one. Out of this kind of um, maze, if you like, of who was this man, what was his agenda, you, you, you know, I think that uh, Bob Rodat, the screenwriter, actually put together a narrative that the ordinary person could follow. In other words, from the time that he 
segued out of his career as a baseball player and into his career as a spy leading up to his most dangerous mission. And that, you know, to be fair, is only part of Davidoff's book and doesn't necessarily give you the whole picture of Mo, which is rather elusive anyway. That's one of the things that fascinated me about the, the choices made, how, how you put together uh, cinematically uh, this kind of story but when, the, when there is, like you said, such a, a wide uh, range of aspects to, to this guy's um, life. See, it seemed to me, you know, uh, we have the baseball, we, we, we have his private life and a love affair with a girlfriend. We, we have suggestions he's homosexual or bisexual at the same exact time. And then we have uh, him clearly um, going to Japan, uh, being an interest, showing an interest in being a spy before anyone's asked him to be one. Um, all, all these different things. Was it the, the part of Moberg's life, um, as you noted, the, the segue to where he is actually going to go overseas and, and undertake a mission we'll talk about in a couple of minutes uh, that has all sorts of implications for it um was that kind of that's where the focal point should be of, of the movie well I, I thought that there was a focal point of the movie which had real resonance to what's happening today namely this is about the birth of the atom bomb and i, I was kind of a baby boomer and grew up under that shadow uh, you know being part of the cold war mentality and the sense that you know, life as we know it could end, you know, during our generation. I, I mean, and this is now real again. It, you know, the Cold War disappeared. We went into a new era. And, and now the, the nuclear age is is back again to haunt us. And, and I must say that this notion that this baseball player somehow looking for his identity was part of this story was maybe the most fascinating element is there a, a uh, an important aspect in making a film like this to match the way you're going to tell the narrative uh with the nature of of the subject you're talking about like it seems to be a psychological movie a, a cerebral movie and uh mo berg was certainly that type of person there is action in it there, there, there's a war scene in it and that kind of stuff but uh you know there are times where it seems like we're really trying to figure out what is this guy thinking you know what's his motivation what was in was that because it was about Mo Berg and a different style, if it had been a different spy, you know, that kind of thing? Well, it was a balancing act because uh, it was very hard to really, you know, understand the man in a way that you might if you read a novel. I, I, I think that one of the stories we wanted to tell was Mo, the war hero, uh, even though, you know, he's an unlikely kind of war hero. And the other story we were trying to tell was the enigma, you know, the man constantly reinventing himself and somehow stumbling in a way into this um, larger than life role. So it wasn't a, an easy challenge. I mean, it was one, you know, telling a, a story which was essentially, you know, a patriotic, even if obscure war story. And the other trying to understand a man who refused to be pigeonholed and in a lot of ways refused to be understood. He's, he's a mystery man in, in a lot of ways. And I, I kind of watching the, the film, you know, I thought about, well, why not make a, make it clearer whether he's homosexual or heterosexual and these kinds of things. But it, it sounds like that's not the life he lived where things were in fact clear. So, you know, why, why do that narratively? Uh, he was very secretive about a lot of things. I guess one of the choices we could have made from the point of view of his personal emotional life was to um, watch the expression straight wash and just say, oh, well, he was a regular sort of guy, nothing unusual. But I don't think that was the truth of it. And although I don't think we've kind of, you know, plummeted the depths of his emotional personality, our feeling was that he was it, straight washing was not the way to tell it that there was something more complex going on there. He was one of three siblings, none of whom ever married or had children. It, it was a very odd family dynamic. You know, having spoken to someone who dated Mo, their view was that he was ACDC. Um, the letters from Estella Hooney 
to Mo, to me suggested the same thing, that they had begun with a, um, a typical or, you know, recognisable sexual relationship, which had evolved into something quite different. And ultimately, she realised that he was not a man that she could marry. Well, I mean, I guess you could take all of this and, and do nothing with it, or you could absorb it and say, well, this was a man whose emotional life was as complex and unfathomable as his career choices. So at risk of confusing people, we decided to take the, the more difficult route. Well, and, and speaking of that, of course, filmmaking is a collaboration, you know, as you're making these choices and, and, and all of that. I, I'd like to talk about your collaboration with your editor, Mark uh, Yoshikawa. Um, you know, there's a baseball section. There's a, lots of stuff on his personal life. There's events in Japan. There's events in Europe. There's a battle scene. Um, there's a lot of dialogue scenes. Um, what was the collaboration like with Mark to kind of figure out, you know, how much time and, and depth to give to you know, a, a simple conversation or a look uh, in a bar or, or an office versus um, how we're going to cut the battle and, and how to make it flow smoothly. You know, what was your philosophy about how this movie should be cut? I really feel I have a, a very instinctive and symbiotic relationship with editors, and we don't have to say a lot to each other to get it. Uh, I mean, Mark and I were uh, collaborating before the, we started shooting so that we were talking about the script and what, what elements needed to be focused on and changed and so on before we started shooting. And, and it, you know, while we were shooting, there was an ongoing uh, dialogue about, well, you need more of this sort of shot or that sort of shot. And this was just ordinary editing common sense. I found that once we were sitting together in the same room, we were looking at the same dilemmas. We could do it this way or we could do it that way. It wasn't a, a question of how, having different opinions. Um, I like to edit sometimes in a completely random way and say, look, let's go off on this wild goose chase in this direction. And Mark would um, always follow me to the brink, if you like, but never let me go over the edge. So I think that was probably the best part of our relationship was that he would, you know, fly with my crazy ideas or not so crazy ideas, but always know when to stop. So that that's that's a terrific quality in an editor to know when to put the brakes on the director. Uh, I, you know, Mark is a, a lovely guy to work with, very kind of calm, uh, you know, which is what you need. You need really nice, good, calm vibes in an editing room. The other thing, if I understood correctly, uh, you only had something like a month to, to shoot this movie, um, including a day, a, a baseball day in Boston at Fenway Park. Uh, and, and therefore, you're globe hopping. You, you got locations all over Europe and, and Japan. How did it break down? What was the process like uh, to get this movie shot to cheat locations where necessary um you know do it all uh in in the time and the budget i'm guessing uh, your budget was not unlimited uh you know that they gave you 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 mean uh, how how can i be such a uh, a genius as to do a film like this in 31 days <laughs> one of the you know uh, logistical accomplishments was that we apart from the one day at Fenway Park which was kind of like a, a more a religious event than it was a filmmaking event so Meiji Stadium in Tokyo we managed to replicate that in Prague uh, we did the whole thing in and around Prague in the Czech Republic you know it doubled for Washington New York Zurich Rome and Tokyo. So it's amazing what you can do in one city with very gifted people like designers and art department people. I mean, it was a brilliant experience. I never thought it could be done. We, we thought, how the hell are we going to reproduce Japan? But, you know, these things are in the details. You have the right faces, you have the right atmosphere. You don't necessarily need the big panoramic shots. So I think that we, you know, the designer Luciano Arrighi is a, you know, brilliant person and able to give us the feeling of a place without 
you know, having to do a Lawrence of Arabia, if you like. I have to give the credit really to our uh, photography people and to the art department. And then on top of that, it's a period piece, of course. Um, so you have to make it realistic for for the era. Um, and, and in terms of the films you've written and directed, I'm I'm not sure how many were, were period pieces. I guess the the sessions was based in the 1980s. Um, but but what's your philosophy and your approach to how are we going to achieve the realism, particularly when we are only uh, you know we are limited with, with, with time and, and budget and location and all that, you know that what was the, the the collaboration like with your designer to make sure these little touches uh, in in a bar in an office building a, a facade a baseball stadium all looked the way that they did back in those days. Well, it's not my first war movie. In, in one of my first. Uh big project was a, a Second World War drama set mostly in a, a prison camp. So I, I was not intimidated by the, the fact that this was period. I mean, you know, the filmmakers have been making period films so long. And somehow, you know, the, the crews in the Czech Republic are so used to making World War II movies that that aspect of it, although it may have been intimidating to start with, is not such a big deal. Ultimately, the, the challenges were the typical dramatic challenges of making the characters and the dynamic between the characters work. In other words, getting the characterization and the narrative right and, and the, the, uh, the suspense elements and all those uh, you, you know, elements which you have to get right, doesn't matter what the period is. Um, and after a while, I felt so confident in my production crew, that I just knew that even down to the smallest thing, they would get it right. I very rarely had to look at something and say, oh, that's not the right period. It was, um, you know, they were brilliant at that sort of stuff. And just putting in those little detailed touches. I mean, I, I, I probably more than I have for a long time developed tremendous respect for the costume design and how much that contributes to the to the feel of things. Uh, we had a lovely costume designer, Joan Bergen. She goes back to my left foot. I do by now have an instinct for <laughs> surrounding myself with people who are going to make me proud of them. Well, well, speaking of, of such people, you know, the other side of, of achieving these visuals, of the key side, uh, of course, is, is your cinematographer, uh, Andres Parekh. In terms of achieving uh, the, these visuals uh, and then sort of the collaboration between the two of you to, to decide what's our aesthetic, uh, what's our palette going to be? Some movies they talk about we have a color palette for the whole movie. Um, this is a certain period, but it's different regions, uh, different location. What was sort of the, you know, the, the aesthetic, the, the mission statement that, that you gave your cinematographer and, and, and some of the things you, you guys worked together to do to achieve that? Um, it's not as it's not as cut and dried as that. It's an evolving process. You don't really give the DP a mission statement. You you say, well, how are we going to make this movie and start a discussion? And instinctively, we both started the discussion in the same place with movies like The Third Man and The Conformist. And we spent quite a lot of time looking at particular scenes, particularly in The Conformist. And although there, there were very kind of simple things, you know, I remember there was a scene in The Conformist where the dominant character was against the light and the more, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the other character or the, the, the character who was listening or being talked to and talked down to was fully lit. And I, I think we used that idea, and it's not dramatic, it's subtle, in the scene where Mo first meets Donovan, and you know Donovan against is against the light, and Mo Berg is brightly lit, and these are really simple devices, but they do. Uh, I mean, we, we both Andre and I had a reverence for this kind of cheesy old manual called the Five C's of Cinematography, which which I kind of you know started with, and you know the the rules still work. So I, I think we had um, an instinctive starting point, which was common between us. And, and also, Andre 
helped me get over my reluctance about multi-camera shooting. I mean, the only way we were going to get through this schedule was by using multiple cameras. We would always work with two cameras, sometimes as many as four cameras. Uh, and the battle scene was only accomplished by really planning it as if it were a ballet. Every single step was pre-planned, rehearsed, and on the day, it just, it really was actually like planning a battle. You know, one side advances, the other side retreats, and I, I felt like an armchair general. It was fun. I mean, in many ways, I found it easier to execute than a dialogue scene between two people in a room. Well, I found the, the, the battle scene uh, intriguing for a couple of reasons. I mean, obviously, it was well, it, it was well executed, it was realistic, but uh, the fact that the key people we're following in the battle scene are doing everything they can to not be part of the battle and to just keep <laughs> their heads down and not get shot because they have a different mission uh, as yeah. opposed to just fighting the battle. They're trying to get from one location to to another. Um, so when you talk about a ballet, what, what was the, the choreography with, with, with having your actors, um, you know, kind of dance through it and not trying to be superhuman? I thought, oh, he's Mo Berg, he's a catcher, so he'll pick up a hand grenade and fire a strike and blow up a bunch of Germans. It, 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 that wasn't what you were trying to achieve there, I don't think. Well, I guess it was quite a, a controversial decision. I mean, you know, on the day, you have to decide every little detail down to, has Mo got a gun? Is he armed? And really, the reality of Mo Berg was that he was not a professional assassin. He was a scholar. His mission was to get information. And I thought it would have been a mischaracterization to kind of give him a gun in a battle scene. I, I, I felt that the point was exactly that, that they had gone in with the Fifth Army to round up Italian scientists to find out what they could, and in the process put themselves in the line of fire. And I guess to have turned Mo into a kind of action man in that scene I don't know. I, I felt that it was um, it would have been a gratuitous kind of heroism. And I wanted him to be a certain kind of hero, a thinking hero. You know, th this part of the movie that, that uh, we're talking about, um, you know, that it, it segues into his key mission where he, he's heading into Europe, um, first to try to find these scientists and then get a, a handle on the location of, of um, the of Werner Heisenberg, who, who in real life w w was the German tasked with developing their atom bomb, played in the movie by, by Mark Strong. Um, and, and Moberg's mission, which uh, from the movie and the book and, and all historical sources say was true, what really occurred was that he was tasked with determining whether he needed to kill this guy or not. Um, how far along were the, were the Germans? And, and so you talked about some of the, the references um, to the look of the movie. It seemed to me at that part of the movie, it starts to look a lot like film noir. And I was wondering what was that, you know, uh, intentional Well, this part of the movie more than that part of the movie, or it just sort of, that's what fit your particular narrative, your story. You know, we had a kind of a film noir thing in our head from the outset, but at the same time, you can't give a movie a kind of a, a, a monotone. You can't sort of say, oh, well, it's film noir, so every scene is going to be shot in a certain way. Different scenes have a different purpose. And I think that when it got into the um, cloak and dagger part of it, you know, uh, where's our man? What do we do? Then, you know, that has its own kind of um, motifs. And I think that one of the things that I was trying to get across was Mo's uncertainty, that he wasn't just a, a kind of 007 kind of spy who said, you know, get this guy, and it was a sort of a single-minded process to the point where you, you know, kill the bad guy. I mean, he was um, grappling with questions like, isn't this like assassinating Isaac Newton or... <laughs> Do I have the right? I mean, Mo was a thinking man. And I guess that quite apart from it being film noir in visual style, at the heart of it was, will I or won't I? And honestly, no one knows how he made his decision. I mean, we know that the, those two characters did have that late night walk 
after the party. That, that's all historically correct. But we have no idea what they said and no idea what was the basis of Berg's decision. I don't think he ever made it clear either. So, you know, the residing mystery of this is, well, he might have killed him, he might not have. I, I don't know. The, you, you know, what was fascinating and ironical was that Mo, who was not a physicist, thought, what's the point? I mean, ultimately, that's what he must have thought. What's the point? Also, there was a, a context at the time of, you know, real debate about what do we do with the Nazi scientists? Do we make them pay for their crimes or do we reward them and bring them onto our side, which is, after all, what happened with, uh, you know, Werner von Braun and da, 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 da. And there was more of an incentive to, you know, oh, don't kill them. They could be useful. So I think, in a way, Mo was caught in this uh, cleft of uh, wanting retribution and let's be sure, and on the other hand, the sense that after the war, there was going to be another war to fight. So, you know, as a filmmaker, go figure what the truth is. You, <laughs> you take your best stab and, and hope that it's not too wrong. Well, uh, along those lines of sort of trying to visualize the fact that he's, uh, it's unknown what he's going to do, perhaps even to himself, uh, right up until the split second, that whole kind of climactic part of the movie, um, you know, with that film noir kind of look to it in Zurich on the street at night where they're taking the walk and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. It sort of matched up in my mind to the, that level of uncertainty that must have been in his head and, and also illustrates uh, Andres' uh, you know, lighting scheme. I mean, it was some beautiful work with, with the, the sort of foggy yellow kind of uh, illumination and, and all that, a sense of mystery. Um, what did you guys discuss about how you wanted to light and execute, the, particularly the climactic part in the street there in Zurich? Uh, I, I think we, uh, you, you know, I had that, um, uh, you know, particularly particular intro shot of the two guys. You, you know, I, I, I said to Andre, I, I want to play this on the hats, okay? So what you see is a couple of hats walk into frame and you follow the hats. I've always found, you know, hats give a lot of atmosphere, <laughs> And um, I, I'd sort of I questioned myself about the fog and the smoke and all of that, but uh, whether that was too much. But ultimately, you do need to go with that. I, I, I mean, smoke is really a, a cinematographer's friend. And um, I, I think that you need to open a movie with a sense of, well, tell us what it's about. Oh, it's about shadowy figures and smoke and, oh, it's a spy movie. And I guess I wanted to do to do that to at least put it into a genre, uh, to, to, you know, not to say this is a, a neutral story, but, you know, look at this story uh, with that kind of atmosphere in your mind. But these things are all very, very carefully planned, uh, it is, you know, uh, particularly when you have that kind of schedule that we have. And with the... Um... If I understood right, the movie was shot uh, with the Alexa camera system and, and, and the uh, Leica uh, prime lem lenses. Uh, had I think the sessions were shot on the on the red camera, if if, if I'm recollecting right. Um, yeah. For decisions like that, uh, is it really just assigned to you because of the budget? Here's what you're going to use. Does the cinematographer just make the decision, or were you involved? In, well, what platform? It's a period piece. We don't want it to look modern and digital. You know how. How did that shake out? Well, uh, you know, in the sessions, it was, it was a very simple decision. The red cameras were just sitting on the shelves, and you could pretty well have, have them for nothing. So we, we <laughs> that's what we did. And, and also, you, you know, in a way, the sessions had a more documentary style about it. It was not stylized. Um, the, you, you know, it, it was consciously done to make it seem as if this – this was this could have been a documentary and you could have been watching real people and to get into that sort of mindset. I, I mean, there are a lot of advantages to the red camera. There are technical aspects of it, which you think, oh, well, I wish we'd have had that on the Alexa. But really, the Alexa is the state of the art. 
And um, I, I think the new element was that we did shoot this on lights lenses. And uh, I'd been a passionate still photographer in my youth and um, was a real devotee of, uh, of lights lenses. So this m m meant something to me. Previously, the lenses we used hadn't meant a great deal to me, but th this did, and I, I could see the difference. Uh, and it's hard to describe, but it really brought me um, uh, more into the photography of it than I usually go. Anyway, I, I mean, on Andre was a very educational experience for me, you know, learning to work differently and learning to work with tremendous artistic integrity, but really fast. Uh, I mean, the pressure on DPs these days to work fast, you can't believe it. I mean, it's just really unreal. The visual effects aspect, the fact that you couldn't shoot at every location that sets and, and locations had to be extended and, and tweaked and massaged. It, how, I'm not sure how many visual effects shots are in the movie, um, but what was, had you ever done much visual effects work? What was the, the approach to it, and, and, and how did those guys kind of help you complete the, the scene, so to speak? I had, had not in the past done a lot of visual effects. Uh, you know, when I had done my previous war movie, which was um, over 30 years ago, uh, there weren't visual effects. <laughs> so you had, you had to build it or it wasn't there or you, you put up a cheesy painting in the background and hope that people would believe it. I think the, the visual effects we used were probably sparse and almost all to do with baseball. And it's kind of, uh, in a way, it's down to a fine art. You have your real crowd and you move them around <laughs> and you do all the stuff and all of a sudden, instead of 400 people, you have 40,000 people. I think that when you combine that with the, with the sound, it's really the totality of it that gives you the effect. I mean, honestly, if you just have the visuals and you don't complement that with the right sort of sound, then you've, you've only got half the story. Uh, so I think that uh, probably it was just mostly for the baseball stuff. I know that there was one shot where we put the Vatican somewhere in the background and it made a bit of a difference, but we used less than I thought we would, strangely enough. You, you know, there's a limit. You have to... You have to have a, a, a certain level of reality for your visual effects to actually mean anything. I mean, for instance, in the battle scene, I think we hardly used any. It was all real. So I think I'm realizing the limitations of um, of CGI. Uh, and uh, it, it's, you know, it has uh, more limitations than you think. <laughs> And speaking of, of digital processes, uh, the digital intermediate phase, uh, I think that was done at uh, eFilm, I want to say. Uh, and uh, what was your philosophy about the purpose and, and how to use the, the DI? You know, some types of films, they, they really have to complete the cinematography there um, and, you know, all sorts of effects and things they had to cheat on location. Or was this really more about finalizing and tweaking around the edges and massaging kind of a thing? Well, look, again, this is a sort of a budget issue. Uh, and um, honestly, you can repaint the whole picture um, depending on how much time and money you want to spend. But, uh, I, I mean, I remember one colorist telling me they had a job where the hero had a, a, a beer gut, had a beer belly, and they wanted him to wear a, a girdle. And he said, I'm not wearing no girdle and so he played the whole movie with his beer belly and in post they had to turn that beer belly into washboard abs which they did but at enormous expense i, I mean i i remember you know not on this film but on a previous film i thought wow i think i'd like to give this woman in the scene a black eye just to suggest that she has an abusive partner it'll give a great deal of character to it and we figured out how many shots were involved and the the number was so prohibitive that <laughs> you know out went the black eye idea but it could be done there's no question that these things can be done and you can reinvent the whole story in that process if you like you know having just given you an example um i would say that in our case the um 
the process was really just enhancing, you, you know, giving it a, a sort of a, a uniformity, an overall uh, consistent feel rather than reinventing the imagery. Uh, so, you know, we're running out of time. So, so to wind up here, um, you've been doing this obviously for, for a while um, and you've done, you, you've written movies, you, you've produced them, you've directed them. Um, you've done do a lot of documentary work. You've been a still photographer. Yeah. You know, what did you learn on this project, um, you know, and, 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 and working with uh, Andre and your other collaborators and just the nature of this movie uh, that you'll carry forward and, 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 and hopefully make you a better director the next time and the one after that? I think that what I've been learning lately is working with, uh, you know, I spent a lot of my career working with material which I wrote myself. And um, after the sessions, you, you know, the, 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 I was on a lot of people's radar um, as a director. And uh, I thought, OK, I'd like to be working with other people's material. And and the question arises, you know, which um, how much do you respect it? You know, I remember working with my own material. I had no respect for it at all. Working with other people's material, I thought this is a, a different kind of responsibility. And I'm still learning that process. And, you know, there's always the desire to tell someone's story, but to tell it your way. And I'm thinking, well, as a writer, of course, I've got it in my head how that picture looks. Um, and maybe the screenwriter did as well. So that's been a new experience, realizing someone else's vision. And um, I don't know what the next movie is going to be, whether it's going to be something I write or something else someone else wrote or a hybrid. But um, th that was probably the major part of it. I mean, when you make films, a lot of what you do is repetitive. It's what you did before. And in every case, certainly with working with different actors, I mean, I've never worked with quite such a, an impressive ensemble cast before. This was a fairly stellar cast. And I thought, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I mean, the better the actors, the easier life is on the set. You, you know, you just sail through it. You don't <laughs> they, they bring with them, you know, a lifetime's ability and I'm... I'm thinking, okay, that's a lesson I constantly learn, you know, cast very carefully because if you don't, you're going to pay for it. Um, and I think that my my casting skills are kind of more and more honed and refined every movie I make. Well, it's certainly, uh, you know, a fascinating piece and, and a great story. And I'm glad it was finally uh, uh, made into a movie. Um, I, I do want to thank you for, for making time to do this. Really appreciate it. Okay, Michael, it's a pleasure. And that was another Studio Daily podcast from the front lines, my conversation with director Ben Lewin about his work helming the new historical drama The Catcher Was a Spy. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch your inbox every month for more newsletters directing you to our monthly podcasts covering the art, science, and people involved in the world of feature filmmaking. I'm Michael Goldman. Have a great day.